Welcome back to the Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Adrian Glover and Sheldon Bennett of DMG to talk about ordinals. We talk about DMG's profile, its carbon neutral pool Terra, inscriptions, and uncommon Satoshi mining. Are you a retail or institutional investor interested in Bitcoin mining companies? The Miner Mag brings you free data and analysis from all major NASDAQ listed Bitcoin mining operations to know who stands out. Check out visualized metrics and data dependent stories at theminermag.com. Welcome back to The Mining Pod. Really excited for today's conversation. We have DMG on the show. We're going to be talking about not only them as a public miner, but also about ordinals. They're really early to the whole ecosystem, inscribing some big blocks uh, with some funny nippy images, which we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, But first of all, welcome both Sheldon and Adrian to the show. Thank you so much, Will. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where you want to start, but I'm Sheldon Bennett, CEO and founder of DMG Blockchain Solutions. Uh, Adrian is perhaps the first employee I hired uh, when we went public um, and is our CTO, and he can introduce himself quickly. Yeah, I'm Adrian, DMG CTO. I'm a longtime software developer who's been with DMG now for almost six years in this uh, crazy Bitcoin world. Yeah, no, it's pretty crazy. And you guys jumped like feet first into it with what's been happening since January with Ordinals. Uh, we'll get to that towards the second half of the conversation. But first off, we want to talk about the mining stuff. Uh, very important. Obviously, we just had our main monthly numbers out uh, solid from you guys as well. Let's go through like a profile of DMG. There's a lot of different verticals we can talk about. But Sheldon, first throw it to you, just like a elevator pitch on how you guys view DMG and how you guys speak about it to others. Yeah, I mean, DMG we view is sort of you know, one vertically integrated company. And by that, we we split our strategy into two parts. We call it Core and Core Plus. Core is just our core Bitcoin mining operations and Core Plus is all of our software that goes on top of our mining. On the core side, uh, we announced an exahash goal. Uh, we've reached that exahash. We've announced some more minor purchases that we've done that will bring us to about 1.2 exahash. Uh, we have a goal to actually move up to over two exahash. Um, so we also announced that we bought 40 megawatts of containerized um, or mining containers that would go at our site in Christina Lake. And just for those of you that aren't familiar with our Christina Lake site, it's in British Columbia in the uh, Kootenai area, just north of Spokane. Um, that site we built on our own property. Uh, we have 33 acres there. We built an 85 megawatt substation. Uh, that substation powers 60 megawatts uh, of built out power for us. Of that, we have in the back uh, about 24 megawatts and inside the building 36 megawatts of usable power. Um, that's that's without the 20% uh, buffer zone in there for, for, for power safety. Right now, what we've announced is uh, we're busy converting the uh, building inside to immersion cooling. So as uh, we convert um, a megawatt at a time over to immersion cooling, we're taking that uh, air-cooled machinery and we're actually moving it outside in the containers that we purchased. And so the, our idea is that with the, with our footprint and ability inside the building, we think we can get about one to one and a half exahash of brand new immersion-cooled equipment into that building. And then we'll take that exahash, exahash point two, and move that outside and, and see how much room we have left over for continuing to expand. Yeah, uh, tell me a little bit about the Vancouver site where you guys are based out of British Columbia maybe your corporate office is in Vancouver, just like more information on profile. Also saw that you guys mined about 70 Bitcoin last month, sold about 84 Bitcoin. Um, how do you guys view yourselves as miners as mostly air cold? Is it, you guys are moving to, uh, to immersion, you said, but how do you guys sort of view like your mining strategy? So, you know, we are a single site right now. We've announced a second site that we're working on developing in Canada as well. But for us, um, you know, we've really focused in on our ROI on all of our investments. So we're not uh, having the goal of trying to be the largest miner. There's lots of great uh, U.S. Canadian public companies that are trying to be the largest miner. Uh, we're looking at trying to be more um, profitable. So we really look at our margins and our ROI. Um, our goal is to, to you know, always have a few extra hash as the base. Uh, that base really is to help our software strategy, which Adrian will talk a lot about. But, um, you know, we do have um, the first uh, clean energy pool that we that we run called Terra Pool on the software side as well. So we always want to make sure that we're feeding our own hash rate into that. Uh, where we are in British Columbia, we are um, uh, 
a carbon carbon neutral um, power, so it's hydrogen or hydro power. I said hydrogen just because we're working on the deal to actually start um, producing some hydrogen uh, at Christina Lake. Um, but we're hydropower, um, and so we've got really clean power up here. Uh, we're, we're we're really excited that we picked this location, um, and for us, the goal is just to keep expanding using clean energy and to try and get as many people that are clean energy focused like we are onto our pool as well. Um, the company uh, did was founded in 2016, just to back up a little bit. We went public in 2018. We've gone through uh, a few crypto winters. Um, our strategy has always been to um, be, I guess, uh, very careful with our shareholder money. So we did not spend a lot of money when you know it was very difficult to buy miners two years ago. We, um, to the dismay or the the pleasure of others, depending on what shareholder you were, um, held back and didn't do large purchases. Um, so that's re resulted in us having a lower cost uh, to get our exa hash purchased. Um, so that's worked out really well for our ROI, and it gives us cash. So we um, did not take on any debt throughout the uh, the last two years. Uh, that resulted in us not having to refinance. We didn't have issues like some of the others miners had. So we've kept a very strong balance sheet. We have about $92 million on our balance sheet. We have reported uh, about $20 million in cash and coins. So we're we're well over 500 um, coins. I think we reported 570 last month. Um, so if you go back you know, a year or two, we had some of the lowest numbers of coins compared to other miners, but um, many have had to liquidate to keep their companies going. Um, so we, we sell off monthly, uh, coins needed, uh, for operations. And then, you know, we always keep a cash reserve and then we've been slowly hodling coins up. We're not a hodler like some other companies. There's some other big companies that have hodled way more than us. Um, um, but we're strategic about it. We just think we're going to come into a period where there's going to be an elevated price and we want to maximize, you know, potential returns when we do sell. Love it. Let's go to the software side of things with Adrian. Tell me a little about TerraPool and how you guys think about that product. Uh, I've heard of a few different companies using it. How do you guys think about it, specifically going back to when you built it uh, to now where the product is? So, I mean, there's, a, yeah, I guess, of course, the side I'm immediately thinking about is the actual development and the technology behind it. But I think really the main thing with TerraPool is that it's a, uh, a pool for um, miners with green energy. And that's how we're going to to use it strategically make it a little bit different from other pools. Um, some of the technology we built around it, uh, like uh, Petra that we talk about quite a bit whenever we get the opportunity, uh, which is where we have, uh, because we build our own blocks effectively, we can uh, we can select transactions and insert them into the block where we want them, prioritize things the way we want to. And that's really the platform that got us into kind of the ordinal space. And, uh, and that's really like, when it comes down to how I think about um, the pooling technology is why we're in it is to uh, is to do more in the transactional side of business. That's a, a important part because when we talk about core and four plots, you know, it's very easy to understand the economics of a Bitcoin miner. I mean, it's really difficult the hash rate, cost of power. You can figure everything out. Anthony does that for you guys every every few weeks or month and and does a report and, and compares everyone. And and so there's the hash rate economy of you know how are you doing and performing uh, creating hash and and selling it and, and and deciding what you want to do with the Bitcoin, but then there's a transactional side that a lot of Bitcoin miners don't get involved in, and so we looked at our technology stack and 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 our experience and said there's a whole world in the world of technology on the transactions after Bitcoin's mined. Why aren't we going after that? And so that was sort of the impetus to start a pool, um, and you know we picked clean energy for a variety of reasons. I mean, we were lucky that we had a lot of clean energy where we're at. Um, but it's just, there's been such a strong ESG um, narrative out there. And this sort of helps with that ESG narrative um, as well. When we were looking at, you know, the Petra side of things and our clean block mining side of things, we were really focusing on financial institutions. And we were saying, you know, why isn't, you know, Bank of America allowing their clients to have Bitcoin accounts? Um, there's a small bank in Vancouver called Mogo that has, you know, you can hold Bitcoin in their bank account. And when we talked to some of these institutions, we found out that, you know, they had compliance issues, i.e. what was in a block and was that, um, were the transactions censored or not censored, i.e. did it have, uh, blacklisted, uh, wallets from OFAC? 
where was the hash rate coming from? Was it coming from sanctioned entities or countries? Was it North Korean hash rate versus North American? Um, and so when we set out to do a pool, we kind of looked at some of these financial institution issues. And then we looked at our own issues as a public company because we run into these in audit where our auditors are like, well, wait a minute, what pool are you in and who else is there? What transactions are you supporting? How do we know that your hash rate is correct or not correct? And all these things, where's the SOC 2 type 2 report? And we kind of started putting all this together and saying, well, why don't we tackle all this in a pool? Um, and that was sort of the genesis of, of why we got into the pool business versus just the software we were doing for ourselves before that, which was mainly a, a product called Helm, which runs all of the mining operations. So that was kind of what was happening. So we built, as, as Adrian said, Petra. Um, we built that second after we did clean block mining. Clean block mining is a technology where we, when we build a block, uh, the block that we can take the transactions from the, the NEM pool and we look at the counterparties wallets and we do a risk rating run through them using our blocks here technology and if we find that they um, are, are are flagged up on on the OFAC list we would kick those transactions out okay. and we, we we know the debate about this are we censoring the blockchain our, our point of view is no we're giving optionality um, because all those other transactions uh are sorry that's that same transaction will be picked up by another pool when it wins a block 10 minutes later so you know the fees are still there we're just deciding for our users that we don't want to be involved in transactions that we've been told by the U.S. government um, uh, we're not allowed to deal with. And so we took that clean block mining. We added in this idea of Petra where we can actually inject a transaction. And so the idea was, you know, if Goldman Sachs wants to send Bank of America 10 coins instead of it going out to a pool that is not KYC, is not clean energy, uh, has blacklisted transactions in there, has hash rate from parts of the country that are part or countries that they may not allow to do business with. We could clean all of that up in TerraPool and make it you know, all North American hash rate, all KYC miners, all clean blocks. So an OFAC point of view, all clean energy, um, and in, insert that into our block that's mined by us and keep that happening over and over and over. So if you're an institution or somebody that has, you know, a level of corporate governance where you care about these things. TerraPool is the option you have. You, you work with TerraPool and with our Petra technology. And we've gone after a bunch of exchanges and financial institutions. Um, and all of a sudden, Ordinals popped up. And all of our technology worked perfect for Ordinals. And so we sort of paused on our first clean transactions and focused over to Ordinals, where sort of Adrian can take over. But, you know, we've got involved. Um, with partners, it's not us on our own. So we know we do do a lot with Luxor. Um, they were one of the first movers in Ordinals as well. But, you know, we got involved in D-God. We got involved in War Bonds. We did uh, work on Board Apes, the BitNips. Uh, you know, we did the Julius Sahn, uh cover on Bitcoin Magazine. And I think the list goes on and there's more to come. So um, I'm taking away Adrian's thunder here because he's the one that actually does all this stuff. Figures Sorry, out how I don't like to talk, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's dive right into that. Um, that definitely took me by surprise that a miner was willing to jump into it so quickly. I mean, Luxor obviously did as well, but they have more of a pool thing going and like a software thing going. You guys are both like a public miner, and then you also have like the software side of things. So that was cool to me, and I hope that miners continue to dive into it because I think there's obviously like incentives to do it over the long term. But yeah, Adrian, what's what's here about the the technology side of these things? Maybe going back to like the first few Ordinals projects, the one that caught my eye was the March one with a project I believe it was called Nippies, which was the Bit collection. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a collection of 100 Nippies developed by artist Scuba Steve uh, combines 100 sequential pieces of art into a single block inscribed with carbon neutral technology. So setting aside the carbon neutral conversation for a second here let's talk about like how you guys came up with you know putting this stuff on the blockchain how do you guys decide what artwork you wanted to put there who came to you did you guys do on that side of things and then the tech side of it also how you guys like actually inscribe this artwork well i'll start with the tech side a bit and give sheldon a break for a minute so that one was interesting doing the uh the sequential ordinals especially as the i mean at that point the transaction fees were starting to heat up a little bit but nowhere near to where we're at today so we wanted to give our client a reasonable assurance that their that their inscription would be 
sequential. And then they were also very anxious to make sure they were under that million mark before we hit a million uh, inscribed ordinals, which we were successful in doing. Um, the trick that we actually employed, um, Sheldon hopefully won't be too upset that I you know reveal the magic, but uh, uh, is that we looked at how the Bitcoin node prioritizes transactions. And um, when we dug into it, um, it's actually quite simple and it, it uses the, uh, the total profitability of all of the different transactions that are available and prioritizes accordingly. So when we inserted that transaction, we, uh, we set the, uh, the sats per V byte at a unique and high level so that it would raise up on priority and keep all of the, uh, the inscriptions together which uh, like that's the part that I found the most interesting was the engineering challenge of, uh, of uh, manipulating the Bitcoin node to keep those inscriptions sequential so that when they, uh, they hit the blockchain, the, uh, um, all the bit nips were together. And, uh, and we're looking at other projects like that, including uh, doing uh, another one where we, uh, we may do a large number that are in um, a set of collections. So. Gotcha. Tell me a little bit about like what kind of tech pieces you were using. I've heard of some people using uh, different versions of wallets that they customize themselves. Like, obviously, it's had the Bitcoin node running and Ordinal's node running on top of it. But what kind of tech stack are you using to be able to push this out into the chain? So we've got a variety of different wallets that we've built in order to do all the different um, uh, research and development we've done on the blocks here side of the house. So uh, we have. Python wallets and JavaScript wallets that we've written. Uh, in this particular case, it was uh, these transactions were completely uh, uh, custom built using a JavaScript wallet that's purpose built for the for uh, ordinals and ordinal inscriptions. It's uh, actually the basis of the technology that we're now using to manage um, all the payouts on the pool in order to, uh, in, to basically scan all incoming blocks that we win for um, any uncommon or better sats and uh, isolate those off into another wallet. So we've basically been building our own wallet uh, to manage ordinals. I think the, the main thing was is that uh, the, we were working closely with the BitNips team for figuring out the distribution side of things. So we um, built the wallet specifically to create a, um, a wallet that they could load in Xverse to manage the distribution of the, uh, uh, the ordinals post inscription. We can basically on the parameters of any customer that comes to us, we can either give you an individual wallet for every single inscription, or we can give you wallets that group inscriptions, whichever way you want. Um, the advantage of writing all of our own wallet software, we can just create wallets at will, and then uh, and then provide secure transfer of all of the um, the private keys for people to be able to manage them themselves. I think that's an important point is that, you know, you can have one wallet with a whole bunch of uh, artwork in it, or you can have a wallet per piece. We're finding that the artists that we're talking to are really going after that single wallet per piece so they can start monetizing their art if they want to sell it or if they want to keep it. They've got the private keys to it. Oh, that makes sense. I hadn't thought about that before. Talking about like the same sort of subject, is there any like customized pieces that you guys have done? Anything with uh, maybe like the ordering sort of things you do with this Nippies collection? And how did you guys uh, sort of like think about doing that? Uh, maybe this can kind of bleed into the, the rare sats, which I know that you guys are still sort of working on that market as well? Um, well, like I said, the, the the secret sauce was the the leveling of the sats per V-byte and manipulating the Bitcoin node to put them in the order that we wanted to. In that particular case, what they wanted was just to make sure they were all together and we were successful in doing that. And now we're looking at ordered collections as well where uh, the actual order of the inscriptions matters and we're looking at manipulating the uh, priority and the Bitcoin node the same way. We've also got our own customized Bitcoin nodes where we can uh, tinker with the uh, the prioritization algorithms internally. So we may go down that road if we have to, but we try to avoid that because it's technically very heavy. So, Gotcha. Yeah, there's an artist that we've been working with that hasn't put up any ordinals yet, but we're hoping to get some out soon. And he's come with two really interesting ideas. One is an Easter egg hunt where we would put part of ordinals in different blocks and then they would be linked by code and bring that that image together over time. Um, so that was a really interesting idea that we're working on with him. And the other is he does a lot of digital art um, where you can expand that canvas and you can see the sort of AI generated art and you can expand the canvas out. And so we're looking at how would we code something where he could start with a certain you know image or piece of art, 
but then you may want to add three or four pieces to it and make it bigger and link them all back together. And so you, you know, you would own that overall image as he changes it over time. And so, you know, there's, there's some interesting things that you, when we're having calls with artists that want to put collections up and their ideas up, they, they actually feed us the ideas. And then, uh, you know, Adrian has to go sit down with his team and figure out how to code them and do them. So far, we haven't said anything's impossible yet. We just keep saying we need a little bit of time and we need to test it. Uh, one thing I want to dive into is just like the question of like a public, publicly traded company, like engaging this sort of activity. And obviously there's been a lot of ordinals discussion online. There's this whole ordinal disrespector idea. People can like code a node to not pay attention to ordinals. They treat them as spam. But for the most part, I think ordinals are starting to take off. And it's interesting to see a company like DMG get on the forefront of that. Going back to the artist part, how do you guys think about who you wanted to include in some of your early artwork that you guys were looking at? And how do you guys think of like the NFT phenomenon uh, writ large? Do you guys see this going somewhere towards utility or is it more just going to be continue to be, hey, I have like this piece of data I want to put on chain for whatever reason, doesn't really matter. And I'm here to facilitate that as DMG. Well, yeah, there's kind of three questions there, but the, you know, the first one going back, you know, when we did our first ordinal project, um, and we talked about, you know, as a public company, should we do this or not? Um, you know, we, we debated that and kind of the answer was, you know, as a miner, you know, things that increase the transaction fees are good for miners. And as time goes by, we really need those transaction fees to increase as the block reward decreases. And so anything that would bring new utility to the Bitcoin blockchain, we thought was good. Um, obviously you've got to, balance congestion of the blockchain and the and, and what happened with the fees um and a lot of people don't really think that high fees are a bad thing especially if you're mine you're like this is great but you need to think about other parts of the world that rely on bitcoin as a financial instrument to be transacting in um and when the fees got really heavy for them to uh, to pay for small microtransactions that's a problem so we were kind of debating all of this and we didn't think it would take off the way it did and the fees would go so high, uh, we thought it would be the odd project. And, and you know, uh, we were just getting an extra uh, fees into our, our mining pool and our miners that would be rewarded for that. And there were two other questions in there. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what they were. Uh, yeah, just about the I mean, you, NFT utility. I'd actually like to address that one because that's yeah. the reason that I'm so excited about this technology. Uh, working with the artists is really fun. And I'm, I'm, I love everything that's going on there, but it's not of great interest to me personally. But I got into blockchain because I believe there's something to the idea of the distributed ledger and being able to put immutable data onto the chain. And seeing that being done on Bitcoin, I think is fantastic. And I'm really interested to see where we go on the utility side of this. And uh, that's the reason that I love being involved in, in, in doing it and stretching the, uh, the capability of, uh, of the Bitcoin blockchain. Yeah, it's interesting that, uh, Sheldon, you said this was initially just like an odd off project and now you guys are kind of leaning into it. And internally, it seems like there's different viewpoints on what this could mean for Bitcoin or has your like thought of it just changed over time as a company? Um, you know, I, you know, I think when we first did this, we weren't too sure what was a fad. Um, I think we're past that now. And sort of it, it goes in with our idea of what we we're doing Petra, which was to try and, and bring uh, different transactions into the blockchain that we're afraid of it. And when you, when I make, made the, the the discussion about financial institutions, they were basically saying we're not going to put our transactions in um, because we can't comply with, with rules and regulations. When I look at you know the world of NFTs and ordinals, it's the same idea where there's a whole market out there that they figured out how to work with the Bitcoin blockchain, but now it has, and I think that's a good thing. And you know we'll promote, promote that as much as we can. Um, I think that you know the Bitcoin blockchain is the best blockchain for artists to put their art on for lots of different reasons. One of the arguments that we first had when we were doing our first few ordinals of why some artists didn't want to use the Bitcoin blockchain was the power consumption. And this is, a you know, a, a, you know, when you talk about Ethereum versus Bitcoin, they say, well, it's not uh, a good use of power or uses too much power for what it does. I don't agree with that argument at all. But besides me not agreeing with that, um, we always won them over with TerraPool because we would say, well, we're carbon neutral pool. Um, we're not adding carbon um, in our operation. And that seemed to work well with artists. And I, I was actually surprised that the NFTers were that much focused on the environmental side of their art and, and you know what impact they have. So I didn't think we'd run into that. I thought artists just make 
art and sell it. And that's how they, how they live and do. And when they started to ask us all sorts of different sort of questions, we were a bit surprised. And, you know, on the ethics of what goes up, uh, we put it in our agreement. So we get to refuse everything, refuse anything we don't like. Not that we're art critics, but um, there was a fear and there is a fear as a public company of putting things on the blockchain that, you know, um, would fall under, you know, hate legislation and things like that, where we don't want to be involved in that, obviously. So we do have discretion over all the art, even with Julian, you know, say what you will. We, we thought that we're not a political company. It's not for us to say um, anything about uh, the politics of that cover. Um, but we did support Bitcoin Magazine and, um, you know, we're not going to get in that, that debate about right and wrong. Um, so we were happy to put that one up as well. We didn't get any hate mail on that. So I guess nobody, nobody, nobody understood <laughs> that it was us or, or, uh, or the rest of the people that are in this sort of ecosystem were fine with, with that going up as well. Gotcha. Yeah. From a utility side of things, I'd be interested to get into that more and kind of unpacking what you guys are thinking about this could look like in the next few years. Uh, if it's not a fad, I certainly see it being more than just artwork. I think artwork will definitely count for something, but the ERC-20 tokens are obviously a big reason for the price spike uh, or the transaction fee spike, I should say. What are you guys thinking about with some of these token designs? Yesterday, we had the recursive thing from Casey and the Ordinals team. How are you guys thinking about these things as of now? Um... You know, all of these things are technology challenges, um, which is why I like Adrian to talk about them. But <laughs> outside of that, the way I think about it is, you know, there's only so much room in a block and those blocks are now being used for a lot of things that they weren't used in the past for with 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 um, BRC and, and ordinals. Um, but, you know, you also have to think about lightning and what its purpose is and how it's going to scale. So I think when you kind of look at the debate of what's a block being used for, and then you look at some of the newer technology and you go, well, you know, lightning can take care of a lot of this uh, congestion as well. Um, you know, I've always disliked lightning from the point of view as a miner where it, it eats away at my transaction fees. But at the same time, it helps with scaling. It gets more people in the Bitcoin blockchain. It gets more people involved. That's a good thing for their overall price of Bitcoin from my point of view. And so... You know, the more usership we can get, the more different uh, ideas that work that can go on chain, the better for the Bitcoin blockchain. So, you know, we're supportive of that. We think that, you know, you're going to run into technology challenges all the time. Um, but there seems to be a lot of smart people out there that are fixing these technology issues. Um, so right now I kind of look at it and go, well, I think the discussion about other things than financial transactions being on the Bitcoin blockchain is going to disappear as there's going to be more and more lightning integration. Um, and then, you know, there are different side chains that can take over, uh, where there are some issues about, you know, an entire block being taken up for one image, um, where we can take them off chain, um, and put them somewhere else and anchor them in, into the blockchain. Um, I kind of like the full image on a block. Um, when you look at how many blocks were empty or very, and are not that full, um, to fill one up, to, to me, it looks quite nice. So we, we're, we're quite proud of the sequential ones that we make and, and the full blocks. One question on that before I hand off another technical question to uh, Adrian. How do shareholders think about these things for you guys? Do, are they intrigued at all? Do they just not care? Uh, do you guys have any active interface with shareholders that would give an opinion on this? I, I mean, I deal with shareholders. So, you know, most of it's been positive. Uh, a lot of our shareholders have been waiting to see what our software revenue is going to grow into. Um, so there's there's this idea that, you know, when you announce a piece of software to do something that is going to, you know, take off and, and bring in a lot of money. But a lot of people miss the year or two before that, that it takes to get software to what I call an enterprise level. You can make a piece of software, but it doesn't mean it's enterprise level. It doesn't mean it's going to work and scale and, and always do what you want it to do. So it's taken us a while to get what we consider to be enterprise software that will release. And so it takes, you know, cycles of, of quarters to really show that it works, that get people onboarded, to get the revenue coming from it. Um, so we have, I would say, a lot of shareholders watching to see if the investment in software is going to pay off. And you can see in our R&D budget how much we've been spending on building software. And so they look at that and go, OK, uh, is that going to come? Important for us to understand and for any investors out there is when you look at DMG as a hash rate company, our core business, you can get like a two and two and a half multiple on your revenue. 
But when you look at DMG as a software business, our core plus, you can get a 10x multiple on your revenue. And so when we look at where we want to go with the company, we have this goal over the next few years to be 50% hash rate revenue, 50% software revenue. And, but the multiple on that, um, on the software is huge compared to the CapEx. And so the CapEx for me to buy an exa hash right now, okay, it's not so bad as it used to be. It would be, you know, 20, $30 million. It used to be 70, 80 million. Um, you know, but that, that, that CapEx is much higher to get that revenue in Bitcoin mining. Um, and it has a lot longer de- or a very, um, very strong depreciation on our financial statements, which makes our company look like it's not performing very well. On software, it's really time and uh, of employees, and uh, it's the services of AWS and other providers that we need to, to pay for. And so, your cost to develop software is actually quite small. The revenue is really fall through revenue for us, um, and it's all pure pure profit on the margin side of software. So, growing software is you know a key part of how we're going gr- to grow uh, investor value in in DMG stock. How are you guys thinking strategically about pitching it? Obviously, there's a lot of pools out there. There's a lot of competition to be a pool and the margins come down to be razor thin. A lot of the reason that Foundry was doing so well was because they ate all the costs, right? They gave everyone no cost to use their pool and they've recently changed that. So we're expecting some hash rate adjustment coming out of that. How do you guys think about pitching now that you know you have the carbon neutral thing, but you also have the ordinal thing? Is the ordinal thing going to supplant the carbon neutral pitch, or are they going to be like in tandem and other products along with it? So we have a strategy um, to try and move hash rate to Terra Pool. Um, Foundry starting the charge has helped a lot because it's really hard to get somebody to go from not paying anything to paying something. And so before they made that decision to start charging, we had put together a strategy whereby uh, if we could, and this is, you know, going back three months or so, if we could get enough ordinal business, we could offset the pool fee side. And so if we could bring additional revenue in through Petra, then we wouldn't need to charge the pool fee. So then if you're a green miner, there would be no difference on being on Terra Pool or being on Foundry. And so that was sort of our idea. And then Foundry started charging and we thought, oh, well, but this makes it a lot easier. <laughs> we can charge some pool fee and, and, you know, and still get um, miners, you know, potentially from Foundry over to Terra pool. But they didn't change our, our, our concept of going to a zero fee pool. So, you know, if we can get uh, enough hash rate and enough uh, projects on the ordinal side, enough ordinals going in, then that will uh, more than cover the cost of us running the pool because the cost isn't that high once it's up and running and you, you, know, you, got your, you got your fixed cost for your servers and you've got you, you have to keep a couple of people on the pool all the time, but it's not super high. The question is, well, how do we ensure we're going to have enough uh, revenue on the ordinal side or the Petra side of the business? And so what we decided to do to try and ensure that is to build a marketplace uh, and launch that for ordinals. So Right now, the way it works, if you want to do business with DMG on ordinals, it's really business to business. So you have to come through another ordinal marketplace or be some somehow involved in ordinals um, and have your client base, and which is fine. We like business to business relationships, um, but there's a whole business to retail that we haven't done. And so now we're, we're um, reinvigorating a project that we had in the past called Wasabi. Um, we've reoriented it to go into building out a marketplace for the artists we work with and to, to attract new ones. And it'll be a portal where you can bring your art in directly to us, it, go directly to Terra Pool and start uploading your images um, and working with us. So that that new revenue, uh, we will pull off scent what any kind of pool fee we would need. You know, as well, uh, because we do run the pool, um, it's one of the few places where you can do an image that's over 370 kilobytes. Um, as you know, uh, you really need a pool to participate with you if you want to do anything larger than that. Uh, and sequentially, if you want to add, have, a, have a large amount that are over that. And that's why we have other uh, people in the industry that contact us because they know if you want to put in a two, uh, a two megabyte image, you got to call DMG somehow. <laughs> you got to go to us somehow to get that in. Um, otherwise, it's just it's just not going to happen. You're going to be putting you know smaller images all over the place. Yeah, OTC ordinals as service. Uh, I want to go to something that Adrian brought up earlier in the conversation and go through some tactical stuff for a second. One of which being 
ordering transactions. Now in Ethereum, that's always been a big thing, mostly because you have the ability to have different unique assets on top of Ethereum. So if I want to trade USDC and maybe some other random token, the ordering of those tokens can really matter because they can be trading against each other. And that's where you have this whole MEV phenomenon. On Bitcoin, that really wasn't the case because of 10 minute block time. You know, there you could probably get your Bitcoin that you want in as fast as you wanted over the last few years because of transaction fees. There wasn't a big reason for it. But the rise of BRC20s and other tokenized standards on top of Bitcoin, that might change though. We had an interesting article from a Ordinals team member, uh, Charlie Spears, on our newsletter Mining Memo about two weeks ago, talking about how the BRC20 standard and other standards that do a rise on top of uh, Ordinals, on top of Bitcoin, could cause some sort of MEV. From your transaction ordering standpoint and what you guys are building, what do you think about that with BRC20s and how are you guys prepping for that, if at all? Really haven't uh, gotten into the BRC20 market. It's kind of not core to our business, so it's not something that we've really looked at. But any place where we're starting to talk about trying to influence ordering transactions, that is kind of our business. So it sounds like something that we really need to dig into. But yeah, I mean, with uh, with having our own custom Bitcoin nodes that we can uh, manipulate transaction ordering, it's definitely something that we could uh, get into if there was uh, uh, a partner that was interested in going down that road. Gotcha. Now, second question, similar line of thinking is mining for rare sats. For those who are listening, you might think mining, just go to mine Bitcoin, normal with an ASIC. Well, there's this new idea that if the Ordinals protocol assigns sequential numbers to all these Satoshis that are out there already, well, some of them might have more important numbers than others. For instance, the first Satoshi after a halving or the first Satoshi after a difficulty adjustment. And the Ordinal standard has applied different rarities to all these rare Satoshis. You guys and some others are already actively mining for these rare Satoshis by going through old wallets, looking at them and comparing them to the Ordinal software or going into exchanges and swapping for rare Satoshis. When did you guys start doing that? And, and, and really, what is the compulsion to do that, given that there's only a few people doing it? Do you guys really see this market taking off to make it worth your time as a business? Yeah, we've been doing it for, I guess I want to say like four or five weeks now, basically since the, uh, since the marketplace started to develop for people that were interested in these uh, uncommon and better sats. So as a Bitcoin miner, we generate uncommon sats every time we win a block. And since we operate our own pool, it's uh, it's actually quite easy for us to isolate those ones. And then um, for the, uh, the more rare sats, there's a lot of them that are floating around in transactions from the people who are unaware of the value of them. And some of them will get burned as transaction fees in a block as well. So that's the kind of data that we're currently mining for. So we're going through all of our wallets and all of the uh, the blockmans that, the, that our pools have made to see if we've picked up any of the uh, the exotic is what they call them the exotic sats from uh, um, from any of the transactions where we have the UTXOs on our wallets and uh, and we've actually got uh, not only through customers who want to do inscriptions with us uh, but also from other marketplaces uh, interest in purchasing all of those sats. I dare say, I don't think we could actually fulfill all the demand that's out there, which means that the value of these is only going to go up. So that's the reason that we look at it. And, uh, and that, and it's like technically interesting, like the, uh, the idea of every sat being numbered and, uh, and being able to, uh, track all of them is, uh, is, is interesting from a technology standpoint. Yeah. How do you guys go about like pricing these things? Is it mostly just like over the counter, you guys come to an agreement and just say like, this one sat is worth three sats in this instance, and I'll trade uncommons for commons, stuff like that. So it's mostly an agreement that will be negotiated on a on a case by case basis. Because even with like uncommon sats, we know that we have dozens, but not even hundreds. So there's no easy way to price something that's uh, that's that that rare of a commodity. Even though there's some, you know, we're getting close to eight hundred thousand uncommon sats that should be out there at this point. Um, who actually has them, and whether or not they uh, know how to access them and whether or not they're in dormant wallets that'll never come back are all possibilities that make it so that, uh, that those uncommon sets could have a lot of value. And we also are working with, uh, again, those artists that, uh, that want to do different things with inscription. They have an interest in the uncommon and exotic sats. Um, they would rather inscribe their art on those particular sats if possible 
and are willing to pay a premium. So it kind of gets built into those negotiations as well. Yeah, that's what I've been seeing from some of the Orioles discussions that most people who want to purchase these are artists. It's kind of like putting your artwork on a more interesting piece of rock or like more interesting piece of material than like just right in the middle of something from Hobby Lobby. Uh, yeah. Sheldon, from your perspective, how do you see this as a business forming? I think there's a lot of mining CEOs who you know, listening to the show or thinking about this process. Like They're operating these huge uh, facilities and warehouses in Texas mining for Bitcoin and they could very well be mining their own wallets that they're creating as well. Yeah, I think they will all start checking. We're starting to get more interest coming to us um, just from you know other miners knowing who we are to start looking at their wallets and, and, and their coins and trying to figure out if they have extra value there. Um, and so we'll keep doing that. Um, we do have some agreements with marketplaces. Um, we've been finding that the prices over the last month or so have been rising. So I think there's more people know about it. There's kind of two things happening. People are looking for them um, and, and trying to get more supply. But right now the supply is quite low and there's quite a bit of demand. So um, we may have a bit of a price spike right now but or maybe not it might continue to grow but we're getting sort of a price discovery happening right now um we're actually surprised uh we looked at selling all of our sats early on um we thought this was great this is going to be a great cash um we ended up not doing it and i think the price tripled or something over a month or so um just with new demand and more people wanting it so we we might take our time selling them but we're definitely working on mining more um and trying to find them and helping others bring those to the market. So, you know, we do know the market buyers and, and we've been busy, uh, um, you know, with those that engage with us trying to, to find extra value in their mining. And it's great for a miner. I mean, if you can make a few thousand dollars here or there on some sats, you know, you know, why not? I mean, they're uh, in general, they never use them. They don't need them unless they want to get into art because those seems, seems to be where the demand is. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a rarity that, um, has value and, uh, and it has a market that's grown very quickly and it seems to be robust and growing. Okay. I want to do a alpha corner as we close out the show here. If you guys will, uh, treat me with it, Adrian, from your perspective, what are some things that people who are interested in ordinals or interested in mining software, I'll even broaden it a little bit there. What should they be focusing on? Some examples I've heard of is building different indexers building different ordinal types, building different uh, inscription packages themselves, maybe like thinking more about how these rare Satoshis could be ordered, stuff like that. But what are you guys, what are you thinking of as a developer in this space? Well, especially with uh, with recursion coming out now, I'm really going to start digging into utility. Um, so like we've got got some ideas out there around, uh, you know, enco encoding the, uh, the energy used for mining Bitcoin, for example. Um, but I think there's a lot more that could be done in that side of the space. Um, I'm sure there's other people who'd go completely other directions with it, but that's where my mind goes is like, really, what can we, we build that's of utility and, um, and makes Bitcoin more useful to more people? Because that's, I think really what we should all be doing. Sheldon, same sort of question to you, uh, maybe on a tech front, maybe just even on a business front, some things for someone who's like on the forefront of, you know, or dolls and Bitcoin mining, where would you point? people towards uh towards building yeah i mean i i've said it many times i'm really focused in uh as a company on trying to bring bitcoin to the masses i think that's gonna really unlock bitcoin its value uh, that we believe is there and many others believe there and and what we need to get the transaction fees up there and to live without uh happening um sorry live after the next few happenings uh, and have enough uh, uh monetary value to keep running our server farms so, you know, for me, it's really about how much can we bring to the Bitcoin blockchain that adds value and whether it's, uh, you know, ordinals, whether it's something the BRC20, whether it's some technology we haven't even thought of, um, you know, we're really just focused on, you know, what is it that uh, will bring more people, more engaged, more willing to use Bitcoin. And that's really, that's it. I mean, as long as we can support something, which is what we did with ordinals when it came out, we just kind of looked at it and said, is this good for the industry? And, you know, we debated it and said, yeah, this is good for the industry. So we decided to support it. Um, and so anything that we think is going to be good for the industry, that's going to make all Bitcoin miners uh, better off, that's going to make uh, an impact in the usage. Um, I think that's great. I think it'll help with, you know, US and other countries politics when usership goes up and more and more people uh, accept it and want it. 
that could slow down what's going on in the U.S. in the debates about, you know, you know, you can say maybe it's not a debate about Bitcoin, but it is a debate about, you know, what's security, what's not a security. Um, you know, when you have a, a general population that sees the value in something that owns it, has it, transacts in it, uh, a lot of those debates are going to go away. And, and that's just the level of education and time. Um, it takes it takes a bit. I, I got into Bitcoin back in 2013. Um, I've seen a lot of education. I've seen a lot of improvements in understanding it. I've seen people that, uh, had, you know, you would think never heard of it, um, yeah. owning it, um, surprisingly, um, haven't convinced my parents to get any yet, but I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> um, but I think that's really what this is all about is if you believe in the technology, then it's really about adoption and, and getting more and more people to use it and, and, uh, rely on it and trust it. Perfect. Well, I love that. Thank you guys both so much for joining today, Adrian Sheldon. Where can we find information about your company, about Twitter accounts, or anything else that you guys are working on? Yeah, I mean, dmgblockchain.com is our website. Uh, DMG uh, is our Twitter handle. So we're normally on both uh, Twitter. We're normally on quite a bit, giving our updates. Uh, LinkedIn as well. Um, we're also in a few other social medias. I'd have to have my marketing person to tell me all of them. But uh, we, we do give regular updates. Um, Twitter is, like I say, where we, we put most things. Um, watch for some updates on what we're doing with Wasabi soon. Um, so it'll be a, a great thing when we launch our marketplace. And uh, yeah, investor relations, uh, any questions that come in, um, unless they're like absolutely nuts, uh, they seem to end up in front of my desk uh, with our investor relation guys and we, we answer everything. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out and ask us some questions. Uh, there is a form chat. Um, uh, I wouldn't call it chat, but there's a form you can, uh, send questions into that come to, to us and, and Adrian and I, uh, and a few others see all the questions. So we're happy to answer any questions and feel free to contact us anytime. Awesome. Again, thank you guys both so much and speak with you guys again soon.